Okay. Um, I will share my screen. And please let me know if you see it. Yeah, I see it. Okay, can you see my cursor? Um, yes, I can. Okay, cool. Um, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so thanks to that lovely intro, you know, my name is RJ Miliana. My, my full name is Rebecca Jean, but everyone, including my parents, have called me RJ since I was born, basically. Um, so that's what I answered to. And, oop, sorry. Where's the... I'm a cough, like, I'm coughing occasionally, so I want to be able to mute, but I can't find it, but that's okay. Um, sorry in advance for my small coughs. But I'm a second year PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History um, it, with Jessica Ware, who studies dragonflies, <clears throat> as you may have seen her on things like Netflix or uh, the news occasionally when she talked about brood X. But I work on parasites, specifically Strepsiptera, um, as Je <laughs> Jenna said, and Right now I'm going to talk to you about parasitoids and parasites of butterflies, since that makes sense because we're in a butterfly club. Um, and I wanted to try to take away how fascinating they are, um, how bizarre and how complex evolution's been in that world. So let's get into it. So here's a brief outline of what I'll be talking about with you today. Um, I'll do a bit of an intro of my work because I like to spread the knowledge of uh, Strepsiptera. They're a very obscure group, even within entomology. <clears throat> and then we'll go into an overview of parasites and parasitoids, defining some terms, including parasitoid, um, a general overview of mechanisms and strategies that parasites employ, especially in lepidopteran systems the impacts that parasites have had in multiple facets of the world, and some identification uh, general characteristics of a lot of the major groups of parasites and parasitoids on butterflies. So I want to start with a bit of an intro about my work, like I said. Um, so I study Strepsiptera, aka the twisted wing parasites. Um, this is what I work on. This video is uh, taken through a microscope, <laughs> excuse me, of me pulling a female strepsipterin out of its paper wasp post in August of last year. Please excuse my shaky hands. The wasp and the parasite were both still alive during this video, but they went straight into a minus 80 degree Celsius freezer shortly after separating the two because I needed to keep them fresh for genomic extraction. So its genome, um, once we sequence it actually later this week, we're doing library prep and cleanup on Friday, uh, will be the second or third whole genome published for this entire insect order. Um, it also serves as a chapter of my dissertation and a reference for the phylogeny that I'll be building with museum specimens. So these parasites can actually be really difficult to find out in the field, but their hosts are usually much easier to catch. <laughs> It turns out that we have hundreds of the parasites hidden in their preserved hosts just waiting to be found in the museum. So the other chapters of my dissertation will focus on using preserved insects present in the museum already as morphological and genetic material. So I'll be constructing a phylogeny or tree of life of Strepsiptera so that we can see how they're all related evolutionarily and how many species there might actually be as determined by genomics and genetics in this group. So this was a video that's playing on loop of me dissecting out one of those hidden parasites from a thread-waisted wasp that was caught in 1992 and put in the museum. And we actually got DNA out of that, which is really cool. So once I've pulled out the live parasite or dissected the preserved ones, um, I go hop into the lab and do some DNA extractions. Uh, I've gotten lucky with my timing starting in science right now because the advent of museomics or museum genomics means that I can extract DNA from parasites that have been sitting in the museum even since 1901. This will hopefully allow me to construct the most comprehensive evolutionary tree of this group ever, 
since I can access genetic material much more easily than many of the strepsipterologists that came before me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what is strepsiptera exactly? So I've been throwing its name around. Uh, it is an order of obligate insect endoparasites or internal parasites comprised of 630 species in 15 families, 10 of which are still alive, five of which have gone extinct. These parasitize a broad range of hosts, in, um, excuse me, belonging to seven orders and 35 families, <coughs> excuse me, of insecta. Uh, these hosts include cockroaches, flies, true bugs, wasps, bees, ants, mantids, katydids, and crickets, um, and silverfish, which is interesting because they're very basal, um, very primal, I suppose, insects or hexapods. So these parasites are very tiny. As you can see in this picture, um, that's a fingertip holding a male strepsipterine. And they exist for almost all of their lives in the abdomens of their hosts. Uh, they're also known as the twisted wing parasites, like I said, but that's named for the club-like structures of the male forewing that you can see highlighted here, which resemble the fly hindwing. I'll give you a brief look at the strepsipterin life cycle because it's really, really weird and I love it before we dive into a general parasite overview. So this diagram is taken from a 2014 paper on strepsipterin development. We start with the first instar or life stage of strepsiptera, which is the infective stage, gaining access to larval stages of its host. This can happen in a variety of ways depending on the host and parasite species. The two of them then develop together, with them typically reaching maturity in synchrony, and the strepsipterins visibly protruding from the abdomens of their hosts. Now, strepsipterins are, <coughs> excuse me, very sexually dimorphic, which you all probably know means that the males and females look very different. In this stage, uh, the adulthood, is where it gets really obvious because the males pupate and eventually emerge free flying and using pheromones to find and mate with females. The females stay worm-like in this form and live their whole lives within the host. They die when the host dies. So it's a very wild life cycle and you can imagine that it changes depending on what host is being targeted since, since each host has a different life history. So now, thank you for listening to that, on to what you've been waiting for. Um, what are parasi parasites and parasitoids? <clears throat> you may be familiar with human parasites like tapeworms, ticks, ticks, leeches, but what are parasitoids exactly? Human parasitoids don't strictly exist in real life, uh, but there's a famous example from cinematic history that I will bring up later. <laughs> You're all here to talk about butterfly parasites though, or we're all here to talk about butterfly parasites. Uh, so I have some pictured here. The most familiar might be the fungus on the bottom left over here, cordyceps, um, which I can imagine you might have heard about. Um, but maybe you've seen things like the top right and top left corner, you probably have, uh, and that classic picture of the tomato hornworm with cocoons sticking out of it. These are parasitoid wasp cocoons that have come out of caterpillars. The bottom right can be a bit of a rarer site. Um, those are red erythroid mites parasitizing a gum leaf skeletonizer caterpillar. So those are examples of some parasites. Um, but how do we differentiate between the two terms? There are a lot of overlaps. It's already started. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of overlaps between the two terms, um, and as is consistent with nature, nature is inconsistent. So though these are categories that generally define different groups of things, um, they, they have a lot of overlap, and sometimes there's a gray area. But the biggest, or let's start with like what's similar, uh, both parasites and parasitoids live on or in another species, they benefit at the, the host's expense because they're extracting nutrition, energy, and space within or outside of the host that detrimentally affects the host. And they cannot live without the host. 
The big distinction is that parasites do not necessarily kill their hosts, while parasitoids must always kill their host to fulfill the life cycle. They are both specialized, um, but parasites are often less strictly specialized than parasitoids um, due to the nature of what parasitoids do. Um, they're usually very fine-tuned and can be a one-to-one -one species relationship, whereas with parasites, it's more often that they can be generalist parasites. The organisms most often classifies, classified excuse me, as such are microbiota as parasites or pathogens. Um, that's a whole nother fight with distinction. And parasitoids are often usually just insects. So <clears throat> now we'll talk a bit about the mechanisms and strategies that parasites and parasitoids both employ and define a couple terms. So parasites and parasitoids can enter their hosts at different life stages, the egg, larva, pupa, and adult. There are very few, if any, parasites on the adult stages of butterflies. So all of the parasites we'll talk about today attack the earlier stages. We refer to things attacking each stage as egg parasites or pupil parasites, etc. Endo means internal and ecto means external. So you can imagine that endoparasitoids live within their host's bodies, while ectoparasitoids feed on the host from outside. <clears throat> Excuse me. These words are a bit more specialized, but idobiont parasitoids paralyze their hosts, basically freezing them in whatever life stage that they were in when they were living. Whereas coinobiont parasitoids allow the host to continue its development while feeding upon it. Most ectoparasitoids, excuse me, are uh, idiobiont as the host could damage or dislodge the external parasitoid if allowed to move and molt. Whereas, <clears throat> excuse me, most endoparasitoids are coinobionts because it gives them the advantage of a host that continues to grow larger and avoid predators on its own, thereby affording more protection. We'll go back to this image in a couple slides um, because I want to talk about entry and exit strategies that a lot of these parasites employ right now. So I went through um, and selected these four major kind of strategies for entry into the host. They all begin with the mother and the egg. Essentially, one of them begins with egg parasites or um, is the strategy that most egg parasites employ, which is where the mother injects the egg directly into the host's egg. Um, this example pictured is trichogramma wasps on army worm eggs. <clears throat> A second strategy involves the eggs laying externally either on the host outside of it or on its plant. And the parasites or parasitoids can hatch and then either enter or seek out and sit and wait for the host. This pictured is a tachinid fly laying eggs on a Datana caterpillar. This one is where the mother injects the eggs directly into the host caterpillar, which is a very familiar one and common one. Um, and pictured is a hypocytor ebonitis laying, laying eggs into a pierid caterpillar. Um, and this last one is the strategy that most pupil parasites employ. And pictured is a calcid wasp on the pupa of a crow butterfly. Now exits um, can be combined with the entries in any way, except for that last one, because it's kind of, uh, unique to pupil parasitoids, but a lot of internal parasites employ the first two strategies, which are where a parasite or parasitoid consumes the host caterpillar and then eats its way out and pupates externally, um, either still attached to the living caterpillar or externally on the leaf below it. 
or the parasites can maintain the host's life until it pupates and then consume the host and pupate within the host pupa, thereby having almost two layers of protection because the pupa, the host pupa acts as a shield while they pupate inside. Excuse me. And then this last one is what pupal parasites do. The first image is a tobacco hornworm. The second and third are a parasitoid wasp pupae in crow butterflies, uh, chrysalis, and a cabbage looper. And then the last one is um, a monarch chrysalis with calcid wasps. <clears throat> so now I will talk about these last three categories um, and this image finally. So hyperparasitoids are kind of wild. Uh, they attack another parasitoid that has been developing in the primary host. So they're a parasite of a parasite. And if you count the caterpillar as a parasite, then it's a parasite of a parasite of a parasite. Parasite of a parasite of a caterpillar. Um, but hyperparasitoids are either facultative uh, so they can be a primary parasitoid or a hyperparasitoid, depending on the situation, or they're obligate, which means that they always develop as a hyperparasitoid. Le levels of parasitoids beyond the secondary, um, which is the parasite of a parasite, can also occur, especially among facultative parasitoids. Primary parasitoids do have the simplest parasitic relationship because that only involves two organisms, which is the host and the parasitoid. So in this image, you can see that there are two trophic levels above the caterpillar. So the Lysibia is a hyperparasitoid and the three at this level would be considered parasitoids, primary parasitoids. Multiparasitism occurs when parasitoids of more than one species develop in the same host. In many cases, multiple parasitism leads to the death of one or more of the parasitoids involved because they compete amongst each other. Superparasitism is when two parasitoid larvae of the same species parasitize the same host. We can refer to these as gregarious species. This happens when a species lays multiple eggs of polyembryony, or um, sorry, multiple eggs or polyembryonic eggs, leading to multiple larvae in a single host. The end result of gregarious superparasitism can be a single surviving parasitoid individual or multiple surviving individuals, depending on the species. If superparasitism occurs accidentally in normally solitary species, then the, the larvae often fight amongst themselves until only one is left. Very dramatic. <clears throat> so I wanted to talk a little bit more about polyembryonism because it's one of my favorite bizarre phenomena in insect reproduction. With polyembryony, a single parasitoid embryo can clone itself into numerous siblings varying by species from a couple dozen to hundreds of individuals or thousands. Uh, for example, one embryo of the tiny parasit parasitoid wasp C Copidosoma bakeri can become more than 1,000 wasps. Copidosoma truncatellum develops as many as 3,000 individuals from a single embryo, which I think is the record um, for polyembryonic species. This strategy allows a wasp to invest energy and resources into injecting only one egg, but still have the advantage of a massive amount of progeny. You can see what that ends up looking like, because this poor caterpillar kind of turned into a sausage full of wasp larvae, <laughs> and down here is what they look like when they emerge. This phenomenon has a special place in my heart because it was what first got me absolutely obsessed with parasites. When I was in my first year of undergrad at the University of California, Davis, I was already majoring in entomology and I couldn't wait to take my first class. So I registered for ENT 10 in the spring of my freshman year, which was a grad student run course for non-majors. Um, where each grad student in the entomology department gave a lecture on a different topic, usually something related to their dissertation or thesis. And the first assignment that they gave us was to write an observation journal on whatever insect we could find. I went for a stroll in the arboretum, found this cabbage looper that I named Henri for some reason, 
Um, I stuck him in a Talenti gelato jar with the leaves he'd been munching on, and then I went home to write about him. It turns out, <clears throat> excuse me, the plant he was on was hummingbird sage, and it was not his species' typical food source. I quickly found out that I'd stumbled upon a really neat behavioral phenomenon, self-medication. So sage is often used as a natural pest repellent because it contains alkaloids that are harmful to insects. Some species of caterpillars self-medicate by eating sage in the hopes that the toxins in the sage will kill off the parasitoid wasp larvae before pupation. Indeed, after a week, Henri pupated into hundreds of beautiful tiny parasitoid wasps. So instead of being horrified, I was absolutely stoked to my surprise. <laughs> Shortly after I moved into an apartment that next fall, I went back out into the arboretum and collected as many cabbage looper cocoons from the sage as I could find. I ended up with six total and had a great time watching the wasps when they started emerging. Um, that's what this video is from. This one lucky moth was the sole survivor of the six cocoons. So this first tiny project was what led me into the world of parasitology, and it also led me here because it was the root of my friendship with one of the graduate students leading the course who had been studying parasitoids. Her name is Jessica Gillong, Dr. Jessica Gillong, and she's now a professor of entomology at McGill University in Quebec, Canada. Since she did work at the AMNH, she actually gave me the contact information of my current advisor, Jessica Ware, um, and recommended me to my program. So I wouldn't be here talking to you today if it weren't for these wasps. So now let's talk about what other things parasites have inspired. Um, whenever I tell people that I study parasites, some of them ask about this film, but it's about like social parasites, not insect parasites, so we'll skip it for now. Um, but xenomorphs from Lid Ridley Scott's 1979 film Alien are a classic example of um, what I might use to explain parasitoids to people, because they're the fictional human parasitoids that people can understand. Um, they were inspired by the parasitoid nematomorph Paragordius tricuspidatus, which grows to fill its host's body cavity before bursting out and killing it. Sounds familiar. They also carry the parallels of embryonic placement into a live host, growth within the host, necessary death of the host, and alternating generations with different forms. <laughs> the fictional symbiote Venom and his children from the Marvel Universe were inspired by parasites that can manipulate their host's behaviors. In video games, a pretty well-known parasite, excuse me, is the flood life form from Halo. It can infect any sentient life and spread from each host. The flood was inspired by fungi, viruses, and bacteria. So pathogens, but... Additionally, a classic parasite is the Metroid, from the Metroid video game series, which undergo several metamorphoses and can be defeated by Samus. Agriculturally, parasitoids are incredibly important for biocontrol on pest caterpillars and other insects that attack our crops. <laughs> for hobbyists and butterfly conservationists, though, parasites can be very upsetting, understandably. So we'll start with some examples of parasites and pathogens that infect monarchs, which are commonly reared and the poster children of insect con conservation, sorry, as they should be. So this one, OE, um, is a protozoan parasite that caterpillars ingest on milkweed. The spores are found on the outside of adult monarch butterflies. Um, they're not attached to the butterfly, but they're, excuse me, they're packed on the outside of its body in between and on the scales. One scale might have hundreds of spores on it because they're so small, as you can see in this image. These protozoa multiply inside the caterpillar and ca can cause weakness, disfigurement, and untimely death. <clears throat> You're most likely to notice symptoms of OE infection in the chrysalis or the butterfly. If you suspect that your butterfly is infected, releasing it will only spread the parasite to future monarchs, so um, it might be best to euthanize it in the freezer. In the eastern U.S., though, less than 8% of monarch butterflies have a heavy spore load, so keeping that number down is a good idea. It's much higher in the west coast because we have a heavy winter, so the spore can't spread as easily over the year. 
Caterpillars infected with OE develop naturally, but their chrysalis often shows small dark spots. It prevents adult butterflies from developing properly, and if they do emerge, their wings or bodies are often deformed. So here's its life cycle. Um, we'll go through it really quickly. So as the monarchs fly about, the spores fall off like litter and they attach to milkweed plants or eggs or caterpillars. The caterpillar is the only stage that can be infected by OE. So once the caterpillar eats a spore, it's infected. The spore breaks open in the caterpillar's gut and then moves to just under the skin and duplicates asexually, with each one duplicating many times. Once it pupates, they switch to duplicating sexually or reproducing sexually. And then after three or four days before the, or about three or four days before the adult butterfly emerges, the parasites begin, um, begin forming into spores. So if not protected from contamination, <clears throat> the spore load in a closed rearing system can become so intense that it'll begin to kill butterflies, chrysalides, and eventually can reach the point where it will kill caterpillars upon infection. So if eggs are disinfected and only OE-free offspring are used for egg production, within two generations, um, the closed rearing system can be free of OE-infected butterflies. So if you're a hobbyist who is rearing monarchs from the wild, if you bring eggs in from your garden, you can disinfect the eggs before they hatch. Um, it won't kill 100% of the spores, but it'll kill enough to make it more than worth your time. So pathologists apparently recommend using bleach to disinfect the eggs. Um, if you do this, you should probably search for more detail uh, than what I'm providing right now, because it's... I think there's proportions that you should take into mind. And people have done more study on this than I have. I've just been reading about it recently for this talk. So another pathogen or parasite is a uh, nuclear polyhydrosis virus or the black death. Um, so it causes caterpillars to deflate, turn black and then liquefy. The virus can also affect chrysalides as the entire monarch chrysalis turns black. If any of you also raise praying mantids, um, like I do, the pathogen can be a big problem in their husbandry because it can appear seemingly out of nowhere and cause your mantis to vomit up or defecate black liquid and then die. So these kinds of symptoms can also be caused by bacterial infections, but they all look the same, present the same, and smell the same, which is really nasty. Um, this pathogen is also a bit less of a concern here on the East Coast because of the freezing temperatures. Caterpillars with NPV tend to eat a little less than healthy caterpillars. They become soft to the touch instead of feeling like a nice firm caterpillar and move sluggish, tend to look oily and slick, and then they die. It spreads as viral particles in water or tracked by other insects from the dead caterpillars onto the butterfly's host plants. So it causes the caterpillar to crawl upward before it dies, and then it'll hang in an inverted V like this. <clears throat> Once it dies, it liquefies, and the liquid will splatter from that form under to the leaves below it. Rain or irrigation will splash and spread that liquid, and other things will track the liquid further onto the host plant. So any caterpillar with unusual movements or appearance should be isolated if you're raising these and reared in a separate container than your other caterpillars. If the host plant is growing where wild butterflies can touch it, wash the leaves with bleach water or bleach and rinse them well before feeding them to the caterpillars. Also disinfecting the rearing containers is important. So let's talk about the insects now, the parasitoids. One major group are the tachinid flies. Uh, they're the second largest dipteran family after tapilidae, which are crane flies, with more than 10,000 species in 1,600 genera worldwide, and probably more because we can't estimate insect biodiversity very well. Many tachinids are similar in general appearance to other flies like muskids and flesh flies. They're large, bristly, and bee-like or wasp-like in appearance. Some tachinids are very host specific, whereas others parasitize a wide variety of species. Their most common hosts are caterpillars. 
To canid flies lay eggs on young caterpillars. The eggs hatch and the fly larvae or the maggots begin to drink the hemolymph and consume the caterpillar. Just before it pupates, the maggot eats its way out of the caterpillar or the pupa and then finds leaf litter and pupates into a small brown pupa, which I did not include a picture of, but they look almost like little brown pills. Some species will leave the caterpillar while it's forming the J or after the caterpillar changes into a chrysalis. <clears throat> Excuse me. The fly larvae lower themselves about three or four inches on a mucus string before they drop to the ground. This monarch was parasitized on the right by a tachinid fly during the larval stage, um, which is unusual in that it actually emerged. Um, usually they die, but only one maggot apparently emerged, which may explain why the metamorphosis was able to continue. If they're super parasitized, they probably will not survive. But you can see how much damage that they can do to the adult form. So we'll move on to the wasps, which are my favorite, no lie. Um, Chalcidoidea is the second largest superfamily of parasitic wasps after Ichneumonoidea, which we'll talk about next. They have over 3,000 genera and 22,000 species already currently described. There are several groups um, of egg parasitoids and many primary parasitoids of butterflies. A number of other families in this superfamily exhibit hyperparasitoidism, which we discussed earlier. Their animal host range includes 13 insect orders, spiders, ticks, mites, pseudoscorpions, nematodes too. Um, the species attack all life stages from eggs to adults and often multiple life stages if they, <coughs> excuse me, are endoparasitoids so they can carry over into multiple life stages. The species can be primary, secondary, or even tertiary, with some taxa actually required to parasitize their own species to complete development, which feels counterintuitive, but that's a phenomenon called heteronomous um, autoparasitism. It's wild. Something that I really like about the calcid wasps that I've caught are weird are how interesting their hind legs can be. The family calcidae often have raptorial hind legs like the four limbs of praying mantids. They use these to hold the hosts that they're laying their eggs in. These wasps are so buff looking. They're so strong. I want to be like them. Calcid wasps lay eggs in soft moth and butterfly chrysalides. The wasp larvae hatch from the eggs and then drink the hemolymph or, sorry, hemolymph or consume the, the chrysalis from the inside out. It continues to live and mature for quite a few days, but then it dies and the wasp larvae form pupae. Once the pupae mature, adult wasps emerge from the pupa and eat a tiny hole in the chrysalis. The wasps from few to hundreds emerge from the chrysalis from the one or two holes that they've eaten. To check if a chrysalis is infected with uh, calcidoid wasps, you can gently push the abdomen of an older chrysalis to the side if it is a swallowtail or something that has this kind of pupa that'll point up. If uninfected, it should move back into place since the muscles that hold the abdominal segments together are still alive. But if it's infected with wasp larvae, the muscles won't be able to move it back into place, so it'll droop. Excuse me. Additional, additionally, infected chrysalides are usually darker than the healthy ones over time. When they become adults, um, they make a small hole so you can tell what's been parasitized, even if you don't see the tiny wasp in your container. But when the larvae start developing and specifically monarch chrysalides, uh, they'll look mottled like this. Something else um, before I forget about all the wasps I mentioned today is that using a mesh cage to rear and protect the caterpillars might not prevent parasitism since a lot of these wasps are tiny enough to fit through the mesh. So keeping the cages inside and isolated actually increases the chance of healthy rearing when it comes to parasites. So the other major group of wasps or two groups of wasps um, are Braconid, Braconidae, and Ichneumonoidea, or actually they're all part of Ich Ichneumonoidea, sorry. They're a very biodiverse and important group. Many of these are valuable biocontrol agents 
that control populations of agricultural and forest pest insects. They are wasp-like in appearance, um, like other wasps, aculeate wasps, but they can't sting. So two families, oh, also, sorry, two families of ichneumonidae and six subfamilies of Braconidae can pol carry um, polyDNA virus DNA in their genomes and release these polyDNA viruses into the host when the eggs are injected. So that's a really cool strategy that they employ in their parasitism because the polyDNA viruses suppress the host's immune system, thus protecting the parasitoid progeny from host defenses. <laughs> Excuse me. Ichneumonids and braconids are mostly very tiny, um, but as I mentioned, they can be relatively large and similar in appearance to the wasps that we might know and recognize on site. Something that th sets them apart from other wasps is their unmodified ovipositor. Female bees and aculeate wasps are familiar and have a stinger, but that stinger actually used to be an ovipositor, which you may or may not know. Um, some ichneumonids can inject venom into a host along with their eggs, but most of them don't use their stinger ovipositor in defense. Many of the species are also recognizable by their very, very long ovipositors, which they might need in order to access host larvae that are protected in thick wood, plant galls, or pupil casings. You can see it's using it like a drill. It's that really thin line right there, and this is the sheath that um, eventually flew off. Oh, there it went. So parasitism results of Burkhanid and Ichneumon wasps are usually the first results of images that you'll see if you Google parasitoid. Excuse me. Since they're probably the most diverse and commonly seen group attacking caterpillars. Evidence of their parasitism is also usually a bit more obvious for a longer time than most other parasitoids I've talked about since the caterpillars often end up with a bunch of tiny wasp cocoons attached to their bodies until the wasps emerge and the caterpillar dies. You can see examples of that in that tiny image. Sorry if it's a bit hard to see. A number of studies have also been conducted on an alternative strategy that the wasps might employ. Very strange, very cool. Um, behavioral manipulation of the caterpillar itself. So sometimes the caterpillar will be rewired chemically into a bodyguard for the parasite's pupae, mm -hmm. and it'll position itself over the mound of pupae and use its own body to guard the very parasites that consumed it from other hyperparasitoids or predators. You can see some examples here in this image with the caterpillars positioned atop the eggs. And there are some really cool videos of caterpillars flicking themselves at wasps, other wasps, hyperparasitoids that come and try to parasitize the pupate that it's positioned over. It's very neat. It's kind of messed up. Um, and this is an example of what that might look like when they emerge. Okay. So Doing this talk, making this talk was really cool because it reminded me a lot about my start in entomology, which was at UC Davis in classes at undergrad. Um, the very first foray into science I had, my first attempt at scientific writing took place during a field study in Entomology 107 at UC Davis, which was um, lo lovingly nicknamed Bug Boot Camp with Phil Ward. And I titled this study Parasitoidism of Euphydris Chalcedona and Batis Philonor, which are the variable checker spot and the pipevine swallowtail. <clears throat> we had to do, all of us in the class, there were 12 of us, had to go out and do a field study over this quarter um, in the fall or spring. And we all did different things, but I was obsessed with parasites, so I wanted to see more of them. So what I did was took um, I took 10 fifth instar caterpillars of these two species, in addition to 10 chrysalides of the variable checker spot, because there were just so many of them available, um, from a field site near Davis, near Lake Berryessa. Uh, it's like an hour away from S Sacramento, for reference. Not that important, but it's kind of scrub brush near a canyon and a lake. 
I observed all of these for one month. I kept them in jars on my desk and I measured parasitism rates and the species richness of the parasites that ended up emerging. These are the key players. Um, the variable checker spot on the left, it's caterpillar and it's chrysalis there. And then the pipevine swallowtail and it's caterpillar. They're all very lovely and they were in high abundance um, around Davis. And these are my results. So all of the pipevine swallowtail caterpillars pupated within a range of 10 days with the first on May 10th, 2019 and the last on the 20th, excuse me. They all emerged a month later and none of them were parasitized. Um, they have very high defenses because, because the pipe vine is highly toxic. So good for them, honestly. <laughs> On the other hand, the variable checker spot saw many parasitoid infections in both the larval and the pupal stages. So only half of the caterpillars successfully made it to pupation, all within a week of one another from the 12th to the 18th. Yeah. 12th to the 18th of May, 2019. The caterpillars that remained were all infected with parasitoids. These parasitoids emerged as larvae from the caterpillars within 10 days of one another, and um, they all belong to braconid wasps from the genus Cotesia and totaled 14 to 20 individuals per caterpillar. So you can imagine tons of tiny little green maggots coming out green larvae. The caterpillars died within two days of the parasitoid emergence, all of them. So out of the five caterpillars that successfully pupated, two of them emerged as adult butterflies. Uh, two gave rise to fly maggots, which pupated and developed into adult tachinid flies. And one of them, that's why there's a star there, was actually cannibalized by the other caterpillars that hadn't pupated yet. Um, and that's when I decided to isolate all of them because I did not know that would happen and neither did my professors. It was a really cool thing um, and led to us reading up a lot about it. We didn't know that they did that. So the chrysalides that were collected also showed evidence of parasitoid attacks, but at a lower percentage than that of the caterpillars. Eight of the 10 chrysalides gave rise to healthy checker spot butterflies, but the other two were proven infected by calcid wasps. So if you found a fascination with this, uh, you can easily do a study like this. It was really easy <laughs> with, with um, I was an undergrad, but it was, it just involved me going out and picking off a ton of um, pieces of foliage that had caterpillars or chrysalides attached to them. And I'm sure that many of you have reared caterpillars and things before. So would recommend finding out what parasites are here in this area. I know that um, the variable checker spot was super highly parasitized, but it's only on the west coast. But the Baltimore checker spot is here in this area, I think. Um, and maybe that's also parasitized at a high rate. And I am curious to find out. So I might do this again during summer if I have time. So I hope that this all gave you a new or improved perspective on parasites and parasitoids, uh, all this body horror aside and that you remember that they're just tiny animals trying to get by, just like us. And thank you all so much for listening. <laughs> I really enjoyed making this talk because it reminded me about some really significant moments that happened for me before I even formally stepped into my scientific career, so I'm grateful. Thank you to Jenna for inviting me to talk to you and to Joe, our friend, the Spider-Man, um, who I think talked to you a couple months back and who got us both in contact. So please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. I'll turn my mic off to clap. <laughs> um, thank you, RJ. Um, at this time, I'm going to open the floor up to questions. So if anyone cannot unmute their microphone, you guys can put it in the chat and I'll read through the chat. Um, if you can unmute your microphone and you want to just ask a question, um, please feel free. Um, I'll give if anyone wants to ask a question directly first and we have a question in the chat, otherwise I'll read that. So, um, 
I'll read the chat question and then we'll see. <laughs> uh, so Caroline asks, is there any way to prevent parasites from harming butterflies? It depends on the parasite. Um, I, I mentioned a couple, you might have asked that before I um, went into each group in depth, but they're, um, yeah, honestly, it seems like the most general good advice is to keep rearing cages if if this is from a hobbyist rearing standpoint, um, keep the the rearing containers inside, isolated, maybe away from a window, and check them. Monitor them constantly just to make sure that nothing's wrong. Look out for signs of parasitism, parasitism and parasitoidism, and don't overlook tiny flies or wasps that might be hanging out near the cages because those are culprits oh. probably. <laughs> If you see a wasp around the cage, how do you, they're both bugs. Like, so how do you get rid of the wasps? Like, do you, you can't spray neem oil because you would harm the butterflies too? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, it's a bit harder because I suppose um, there are mesh cages that like try to go for the smallest mesh possible that still has good airflow. Um, yes. Yeah. I have butterfly cages, but I'm 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 really kind of talking about the wild as well because oh for sure I've I've raised them for couple, so many years now I'm I'm ready to just watch them grow in my backyard naturally <laughs> see how that works out <laughs> yeah I I suppose honestly there's not really there's not really a great way to prevent them um, short of finding out hyperparasitoid their natural enemies with hyperparasitoids and somehow rearing those or encouraging the growth of those. Um, but that's a bit harder because it's not something that's widely implemented. Like, mm. um, yeah, there, there are, there are instances of that in agriculture where really effective hyperparasitoids, if there's a beneficial crop insect that's being parasitized, um, the hyperparasitoids can be employed and reared in labs and then um, yeah. unleashed in large scales, but that's a bit harder to do from a smaller standpoint with a garden. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I wish I could help more. Um, I suppose. Like a joint and go. Huh? Yeah, with the parasites like the pathogens, um, cleaning your milkweed or host plants with a bleach solution might help with those but with the wasps it's it's harder thank you mm -hmm. um so continuing in the chat uh chris williams says great program i agree um eddie says any study of aphids oh yeah um there are plenty of parasitoids of aphids that came up um actually when i was doing my undergraduate thesis one of my lab mates was working on aphid mummies that parasitoids had mummified. Um, that's a whole nother system with its own wild mechanisms. But um, there, a lot of these major groups, the tachinids, the, well, for sure, the braconids and ichneumonids um, parasitize aphids. So they employ many of the same mechanisms, um, but it's really cool. Would recommend reading about those because there are a lot of weird defense systems and exit strategies like mummification and uh, lamellocytes, like encapsulation. Yeah. Everything to do with parasitoids is just so bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Gary says, fantastic presentation. Uh, he learned a lot that the movies you mentioned were fiction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, and then he said he thought they were documentaries. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then he asked, with polyembryonism, are all the offsprings clones? And it's, he says it seems to be an evolutionary disadvantage. Yeah, that is something that comes into play. That's the kind of checks and balances. Um, like, it's it's similar to the disadvantages of asexual reproduction. Um, but it, if I'm remembering right with Copitosoma, um, temperature or condition can influence the number of embryos that end up replicating and the number of eggs that the female will lay. So it's kind of a similar 
um, similar balance of strategies with asexual and sexual reproduction, where if conditions are bad, um, they might go for more investment in more eggs and fewer embryos or embryo replicates. Uh, whereas when conditions are great, they'll go for the boom and bust. Um, going through the chat still, uh, Caroline said, very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, Eddie said, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Marjorie said, your studies are amazing. Um, and I'm so glad. <laughs> They're supposed to be amazing anyway. <laughs> I make a lot I knew of what you I meant. Make, it's okay. I, I make a lot of typos. Oh, <laughs> Edie. Okay. I, I think I said that right now. I hope. Um, I haven't had that ice cream in forever. My actually my dad stopped getting that. He likes blue bunny now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the difference is. <laughs> um, but uh, I actually I had a question. So I know when I worked with uh parasitoids of uh, the brown marmorated stink bug, uh, Tracolcus mm -hmm. japonicus, when we would parasitize them, which they are an egg parasitoid for everyone, um, and they lay their eggs into the brown marmorated stink bug eggs. And this tiny, tiny little wasp, I remember watching it, it was so fascinating. They have these thick clubbed antennas. So when the wasp would come over to the stink bug eggs and it wanted to check to make sure another parasitoid hadn't parasitized it, it would do like almost like this little, uh, we called it like a beating drum. It would take its antennas and it would beat down on the eggs, I guess, to try to feel vibrations of if there's another egg. Um, do these parasitoids have anything like that that will like identify, maybe, yeah, maybe be identification to them that, okay, another parasitoid parasitized this, I don't want to touch it. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of them show that. There were some papers that I, it was like going down a rabbit hole again with this talk, like when I was making it, because um, it's fascinating. A lot of them use olfactory cues, so that's probably also what the antennae drumming might have been helping with. Um, so they, the chemical composition of the host will change most likely um, with parasitism. And a lot of hyperparasitoids uh, will use that to find their host, which is the parasite. So the parasites of the parasites will use that to look for them. Whereas, um, yeah, the, the parasites on the same level might use that to avoid them. Okay. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, I always, I loved watching it. Uh, I wish I had a video to share when it was very fascinating. And like, cause like, sh they would be very thorough inspecting every egg, doing their little drum. Um, so it was very, very cool. Uh, we have another chat. Uh, Gary asked, is there any evidence that the spores of OE can survive the freezing temperatures found in the north? Yeah, there's, um, at much lower levels after the winter than, as, as far as I can tell, than um, in temperate regions, because in temperate regions, since there's no freeze, uh, they'll just build up the spore levels until they're eradicated in some way again. But for us and the North, um, I think the range is as high as some, some parts of Canada. OE is everywhere. So it, it'll follow the monarch's range. And I think there's nowhere that it hasn't touched within that range. But um, since it's at such lower levels, I think it's like three times higher on the West Coast and in temperate regions. Uh, that shows that the freeze does something, but it doesn't wholly eradicate it. So um, they, it, it can survive at low levels, maybe due to actually uh, commercial, and, or not commercial, well, hobbyist rearing. Um, so the closed systems, people might unknowingly be spreading OE, um, to the wild and in closed systems, because it's possible that it can't necessarily overwinter. And I think from one of the papers I was looking at, um, its levels were climbing, uh, with a correlation of increased rearing in conservation efforts. So that was kind of troubling, but, um, Good to know. So it's one of the more dangerous things to monarch conservation right now. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, 
Yeah, go ahead, Joyce. Uh, let's see. Um, right. So I found um, some a black swallowtail uh, caterpillar on some parsley uh, at a farmer's market. So I thought, okay, I'll try to rear a butterfly. You know, many people do it, of course. I hadn't done it yet. Uh, so very excited. And um, it developed the, the pupa. It was late in the season, so it overwintered in my garage. I was looking forward to it emerging and it never seemed to emerge. I had it in a little cardboard box with a piece of plastic that I poked a bunch of holes in. So I, you know, glance at it once in a while, hoping to, to see the adult butterfly emerge any day now. And then it seemed to be taking too long. So I finally opened up the little cage, took it out, and it was like in totally intact. And I turned it around and it was like, oh my goodness, there's a at least a quarter inch hole, a perfectly round hole in the side of the uh, pupa. And so it seems like it had been targeted by some parasitoid um, that goes for pupal stages. And I'm wondering if you have any clue as to what might have parasitized it because the culprit went away. So I, I all I had was the, the pupa with the, the hole in it and um, never got to see the parasitoid that emerged. So That's any clue? Thing. Yeah, it sounds like a calcid wasp. Um, yeah, it was so big compared to the chrysalis. Oh, for sure. Um, then it actually might have been a tachinid because the flies are a lot bigger than the typical calcid wasp. So the round, the perfect hole description makes me think of calcid wasps, but um, okay. it can still, tachinids also chew their way out uh, and they probably could form a perfect hole. Um, the only thing is that if you didn't find anything else in the cage, I would still assume a calcid because just a big one. Okay. Um, they they are they can be pretty big, but the um, oh, if you found another pupa on the floor of the rearing or the box, um, mm. then that would have been the tachinid because they leave mm. behind a pupil casing, oh. um, like mm -hmm. a brown little pill that would have been it would have been yeah. open at one end because they didn't see that it. didn't see that okay then i would say probably a calcid yeah okay. one. how That's, large do those get the adult um, calcid? they can be pretty big uh oh, so, so um this is this is a uh, wade wander a great talk i very much enjoyed it um it might be that the culprit in this uh -huh. case was a Newman wasp in the genus Trochus. Mm. Okay. They specialize, mm. they, they specialize on, I think there's seven different species and they all specialize uh -huh. on uh, swallowtail butterflies. Uh-huh. I trust that because I'm, I'm very like <laughs> surface level identification with these like broad level surface level, surface, sorry, identification. So if you... I, I can second, I just support this happening, so. Okay. What was that, Wade, again? What was the genus? A trogus, T-R-O-U-G-U-S. It's an ichneumon. Okay, I will look up that and see uh, what the culprit might have looked like <laughs> that emerged. Yeah, they're, they're pretty big and obvious. They got like red abdomens and, huh. and iridescent shiny blue black wings mm -hmm. okay probably Paul agrees with wade uh -huh. okay it's many a butterfly and she agrees with wade that mm -hmm. it's the wasp always that one always that oh. one okay great well thank you for the information everybody that's the highest authority there paula <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad that you can provide this because i was like i know i just know there's going to be people who are like butterfly parasitoid people who are here. So like, <laughs> thanks for coming. Like, sorry if I had that, that, that was a great program. That was very, very, very good. Very good. <laughs> really excellent. Yes. I appreciate uh, it. RJ, I wouldn't invest too much 
um, in the idea of studying uh, Baltimore checker spots because oh. <laughs> they are nowhere near as abundant as variables apparently are in California. Oh, really? We are, oh, we are okay. really oh, losing oh. them here so very badly. Um, so there, the number of places you can find them is shrinking and the populations are shrinking. Oh, shoot. How about further north, Sharon? Do you think maybe the further north they're doing There better? are some spots. I When I used to do the count report, there were some spots, one in Rhode Island I, is coming to mind where, yes, there was a bog that had hundreds of Baltimore checker spots, but not in New Jersey anymore. No, not New Jersey. Uh, well, yeah. you're in Canada. Maybe you'll find them up there. <laughs> that could be. It's a shame because they're so beautiful. If I can say something outside of Saugerties, there is a spot where there are thousands that they count on their 4th of July butterfly counts. Ah. Where is this? It's outside of Saugerties in New York, just up from me, you know, an hour or so. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they, I've been there to see them. It's just amazing to see how many they have. It's autumn. It, it's just awesome. Wow. Maybe you can share the, uh, you can put a pin on that spot and share it with people. Um, okay, I'll see if I can look it up right now. Okay, I'm going to, let me see. Um, I'm going to stop recording. Uh, so everyone just hold on. <laughs>